So the worst idea ever is now that I'm going to have a go with the proper team, who, as you probably can see behind me, are really good at this. Welcome to The Travel Show, coming this week from Andalusia in Spain. Now, this region is known as a golfer's paradise, but it's also the HQ of a rather lesser known and pacier ball game called Bossable, which, believe it or not, is played on a trampoline. Now, I've been convinced to give it a go myself a bit later in the show, and who knows how that's going to go. Whoa! But in the meantime, here's what else we have coming up. 80 years on from the launch of an airship that made headlines, Rajan travels to Germany to climb on board a modern take on the Zeppelin. We get a taste of authentic Creole cuisine in the Seychelles. And our global guru Simon's here, with advice about flying into Florida and tipping etiquette in New York. This is the Bodensee, Germany's largest lake on the Austrian and Swiss border. It's grey and overcast now, but in the summertime it becomes Germany's Riviera with everything from beaches to vineyards and orchards. And this town, Friedrichshafen, will always be famous in world history for one thing. With Germany's new Zeppelin just completing her first long distance flight to South America, their special interest in these pictures of the world's largest airship with her sister, the Graf Zeppelin, on their recent flight over Berlin, when the combined roar of their engines drowned even the noise of the traffic. Rio, LA, Leningrad, Cairo. Amazing, went to all those places around the world. It was a step of incredible innovation in this time all things and all components and materials were new and not proven. And it was the idea. Like early space exploration in the 60s, the first steps of men in the, in, the, in the space. In the 20s and early 30s, a flight on a Zeppelin was the height of glamour and the airship travelled the globe, even flying as far as Tokyo. But then disaster struck. The actual crash of the Hindenburg an airship destroyed in less than half a minute. In 1937, the Hindenburg Zeppelin, the world's largest ever aircraft, exploded on a transatlantic flight to New Jersey. The Hindenburg disaster was the, the first aviation crash or the first big disaster in front of a moving camera. Here in the Zeppelin Museum, there's a recreation of part of the doomed ship. So this is what it would have been like to get on to the Hindenburg. And even the toilets here. Yes. These are the toilets. Yes. <laughs> now I'll show you the cabins. Mm -hmm. Two bed cabins. You have a small wardrobe. Wow, well, sink. Very clever. Very clever. Yeah. So how many nights would a transatlantic passenger spend in a bunk like this? Two to three nights. Two to three nights. Yes. I could happily stay here. How many passengers would be in these areas? Passenger capacity was uh, 50 passengers. That's the maximum number, 50? Yes, yes. And how many people actually working on the airship? To, to bring the 50 passengers over the North Atlantic, you need around 50 crew members. Really? The yes, same, relation one-to-one. One. 
Transatlantic flights might be a thing of the past, but it's still possible to take a ride in a Zeppelin today. From an airbase in Friedrichshafen, the Zeppelin NT flies tourists around the local area. NT stands for New Technology. Take it first. Why not? Yes. <laughs> and these airships are constructed differently to the originals, crucially using helium rather than hydrogen. There's a lot, a lot of variables. So, for example, landing on a windy day and landing on a calm day, very different techniques. We don't use runways, we just land in a field, so every landing is different because this is a fly-by-feel aircraft, it's not a fly-by-numbers. The aircraft can only fly in certain weather, and it's touch and go whether we'll be able to take off. But then we get the go-ahead. And on we go. Floating serenely over the clouds. I've got to be honest, I didn't imagine it would be like this. It's literally like floating in the air. It's uh, a really peaceful, lovely experience. And the views below look great. Any turbulence you feel, it's not the, the real vibration type of turbulence you feel in an aeroplane. It really is like a boat going and riding over the waves. Check this out, here's one thing you could never do on an aeroplane. Open the window. Wow. In a world that's now looking for ever more environmentally friendly ways to travel, engineers have come up with designs for vast new airships powered by solar energy or other sustainable sources. But here, at the home of the Hindenburg, they say that it's unlikely we'll ever see a return to the glory days of luxury airship passenger travel. There's the idea in some people that uh, if there would be no war and there would be helium from America, then the rigid airships had a great future, but I think it's not true. The flying boats, the, the aviation nations in the 30s, the Americans, the British, the German, the French, the Italian, uh, had um, four or six engined transatlantic flying boats in preparation, and this aircraft would be, we sagt man das, weggeblasen or redundant. Yes, yeah. the airships in, in a time of five to ten years. now for Citizens, our regular look at the people who make a place. And this week we're off to the Seychelles for a spot of authentic Creole cuisine. I'm Guito, manager of the Marie Antoinette restaurant in the Seychelles. We welcome guests from all over the world. They come and visit us just to taste our famous, authentic Creole cuisine. Every morning around um, nine o'clock, I visit the market just to purchase my local spices, my fish and my vegetable and fruits for the day. Bonjour, ça va? Every day the market has to see me buying the fish and the fishermen would as well save the fish for me because they would know I'm coming to purchase. And even for the fruits and the vegetables they would keep for me, even if I'm a little bit late, they would still wait for me to come and fetch. <laughs> this is where the magic happens. We're going to prepare the fruit bat curry. When we tend to tell our guests that we've got fruit bat, and they will be like, oh, you know, like sort of, do you eat that? And I try to convince them that the fruit bat is a very nice meat and that it's a very clean meat, that they eat only fruits. It's a very traditional local dish. We're a Creole restaurant, so we, we must have fruit bat on our menu. Now we're frying our ginger and garlic 
To make the, the paste, we've got to add the red wine. We shouldn't forget about the red wine. Now we've got a very nice thick sauce, the gravy, and we're going to put uh, add the fruit back to it and put it on a fairly slow fire that it cooked nicely and um, soft. Maria Toinette is the only restaurant on the island that offers this type of local cuisine where you get to taste a little bit of everything, which gives the tourist a chance to have the real Creole taste. Still to come on this week's travel show. I take to the trampoline to try a new sport here in Spain. <laughs> and ever worried about how much to tip? Global guru Simon Calder has the answer. So, don't go away. Mm, mm, mm. The Travel Show, your essential guide wherever you're heading. Welcome to the slice of the show that tackles your questions about getting the best out of travel. We're off to explore the Black Forest shortly, but first... Health authorities are warning that the Zika virus is spreading. The mosquito-borne infection is harmless to most people, but may cause birth defects when caught by pregnant women. Locally transmitted cases have now been reported in Thailand and the Maldives, as well as Latin America and the Caribbean. Prospective visitors who are pregnant should take medical advice before travelling. Next, David Lucas and his wife are after advice on the beautiful southwest corner of Germany. We're off to the Black Forest and would welcome advice on places to see that we can reach without a car. The Black Forest, draped across the hills east of the Rhine, was rewarded with national park status in 2014. Quite right too. Start in either of the two urban hubs, Baden-Baden, a beautiful spa town in the north of the Black Forest, or the handsome cathedral city of Freiburg in the south. Public transport is excellent throughout the Black Forest, with the historic Offenberg to Konstanz railway a particular favourite of mine. It passes through donau Shingen, the source of the Danube, and close to Titisee, the loveliest of the Black Forest lakes. Jackie Gooch says she's been deterred from visiting Florida because of the length of the queue for arrivals. She wonders... Are there any Florida airports that are more efficient than Miami, such as Tampa or Fort Lauderdale? There's a handy online resource giving a snapshot of waiting times for border formalities at all the main US gateways. Just go to awt.cbp.gov. I took a date and time at random and found that travellers at Miami experienced an average waiting time of 34 minutes, with some taking up to 78. The nearby airport of Fort Lauderdale was three times quicker, while Tampa, across on the Gulf Coast, was twice as fast. Alternatively, route your journey through one of the countries that offers pre-clearance, such as Ireland or Canada. Your process through passport control and customs before you board your flight to Florida, which means that when you touch down in Miami, you're regarded as a domestic passenger and can breeze across to Miami Beach, pausing only to pick up your baggage. Finally, Rachel James is looking forward to a trip to New York City, but she has one nagging concern. I'm worried about the etiquette of tipping. Rachel, in Eurasia and Africa, tipping tends to be something you do to reward good service. In the US, and especially New York City, a gratuity is regarded as the customer's obligatory contribution to the staff member's wages. In restaurants and for cab drivers, 15% is the absolute minimum. Leave less than that only as a protest against terrible service. In addition, bartenders will make you feel more comfortable if you tip a dollar per drink and in fancy Manhattan hotels, anyone who delivers you and your luggage to your room will expect $5 more if you've got an ambitious amount of luggage. 
Remember, there's no charge for the tips on the travel show, so whether you're planning a trip along Broadway or the Pan American Highway, just email thetravelshow at bbc.com and I'll do my very best to find you an answer. From me, Simon Calder, the global guru, bye for now and see you next time. And finally this week, we're in the small town of Estepona in southern Spain, where I jump in with both feet to learn a ball game that's unlike anything I've tried before. This area to the west of Marbella on the coast is a great place to get stuck into sports. Throughout the year, this municipal complex is crammed with locals getting active with games from tennis and football to basketball and ping pong. But there's one sport that's a little bit different to all of the others. It's called bossa ball. It's like volleyball with elements of football, gymnastics, capoeira, and what's more, it's played on a huge trampoline slash bouncy castle. The rules are fairly simple. Two teams of five aim to get the ball over the net to land in the court of the opposing side. There's usually a musical accompaniment of lively Brazilian samba to get the atmosphere going and, in an added twist to please the crowds, extra points are awarded for spectacular moves like this. It was the brainchild of Philip Eichmanns, a Belgian former music manager whose inspiration came in the 1990s on a Brazilian beach. They play foot volley there. I saw the real capoeira. I was always a big fan of Brazilian music and also a big soccer fan. I remember that the trampolines was by far the nicest thing to do uh, while you were having a, a, a physical education classes and I started to mix that all up and that's how the mix of volleyball, soccer and gymnastics was born. Philip's bossable dream first became a reality in the mid-2000s. He set up his HQ here in Estepona and the sport has spread to over 25 countries, culminating in a bossable World Cup that's been contested in Turkey and the Netherlands in recent years. This unusual bouncing game has drawn in players across the world and, according to Philip, anyone can play. A lot of sports, you play them on a rigid uh, floor, let's say, floor structure. So with uh, having the, uh, the air, it's a, lot of, uh, it's a lot less pressure on your muscles. That's why, I mean, we had people from until 90 years playing it. So uh, we're up to uh, 100. Uh, that's the next, uh, the next idea. While there aren't any centenarians on the court today, there is a gender mix, which is typical of a boss ball team. I think it's really nice to play together because most of the time they say boys are better than girls, but now you play mixed, so that's a really big challenge for girls, I think. While the game looks like simple fun, there is a serious commitment to making sure boss ball is easy on the environment. I travelled up to Philip's Bossa Farm, just a short drive from the Estepona town, where his team has been busy recycling. Each old inflatable court can be made into 500 shoulder bags. We transformed the PVC that we're now using from the courts to something useful for giving them a new life, basically. For Philip, this is all part of what it takes to be a modern sport catering for new sensibilities in a fast-moving world. The, the sustainability, it's, it's important for us the, to mix various sports is important and you have that movement because I mean some of the older sports were a bit boring too and they were, they were there to entertain people in, uh, in small uh, cities to have them a good uh, Sunday afternoon after going to church but I mean things are changing. People have changed so sports have to adapt to that. Whether I could adapt to Bossable was another question entirely. But I wasn't going to miss my chance to have a go. 
So you're going to teach me a few of the skills? We'll try to. We'll, we'll try to, yeah. We'll, we'll give it a <laughs> Let's see how it goes. It's really fun. <laughs> and it is, but you also need to be good at stuff, um, which is unfortunately a bit of a shortcoming in my case. Hitting balls off the head for the first time in my life um, seemed to be okay, but I couldn't get it over the net. So the worst idea ever is now that I'm gonna have a go with the proper team, who as you probably can see behind me, are really good at this. Um, prepare yourself, because this is gonna be embarrassing. It's certainly unconventional, but Bossable is growing. It's one of several new sports that may yet challenge the traditional games and even one day come to redefine what we consider sport. Well, that's all we've got time for this week, but do join us next week when we've got a great show coming up. Carmen visits some natural hot springs in Japan and Ben wraps up warm to try a spot of camping high in the Austrian Alps. Rather him than me. It's not really the morning I was hoping for because you can't really see anything because it's such a blizzard. But overall it was a great experience, something that you know you don't do every day. Um, but now it's time to get warm, so see you later. So do catch us then if you can. And in the meantime, don't forget, you can check us out on social media too. The details of how to do that are on the screen now. But for now, from me, Crystal Lyle, and the rest of the Travel Show team here in Spain, it's goodbye. <laughs>